This is chapter four of Paul Bond's Archaeology, a very brief introduction. Chapter four, how did people live? Much of archaeology is devoted to studying the lifestyles of the dead and buried, trying to assess what people looked like, how healthy they were, what they ate, and what they died of. The last two topics are not necessarily related, although the overweight wife of the Marquis of Dai from 2nd century BC China appears to have died of a heart attack caused by acute pain from her gallstones an hour or so after devouring a big feed of watermelon. 138 melon seeds were found in the stomach and intestines of her mummified corpse. Food seems to have been important to this lady since her tombstone contained numerous prepared dishes and containers, with labels attached and slips describing the composition of their dishes, a kind of Chinese under takeaway. Subsistence, the quest for food, is the most fundamental necessity of human life, and archaeology has developed many ways to investigate the clues to what people ate. The vast majority of these clues take the form of animal and plant remains that may be found in a human occupation site, and which are studied by zoo archaeologists and archaeobotanists respectively. They are indeed sometimes the residue of food that has been consumed, but not necessarily all of them. Plants, for example, can be used for many other purposes. From raw materials to drugs, animal yield, animals yield useful substances such as bone, antler, horn, ivory, fat, sinew, hides, and furs. And birds offer bones and feathers. In addition, many organic remains, especially those of animals and birds, could have been brought into the site by other predators. Or they could represent pets, though dogs and guinea pigs were eaten by some cultures in the past and still are in some parts of the world. The only indisputable proof that a plant or animal was actually eaten is its presence in a human stomach or a coprolite, ancient turd. But since such finds are rare, the assumption has to be made that they were eaten, and one has to make this inference from the context or condition of the finds, such as charred grain in an oven, cut or burned bones, or residues in a vessel. It is unlikely, but always theoretically possible, that, for example, the occupants, occupants of a Paleolithic site full of reindeer bones were vegetarians who just happened to hate reindeer, or who needed lots of bone, antler hides, but detested the meat. Even if the assumption can plausibly be made that the remains are food, there are further challenges to be met. For example, one has to try and figure out the relative importance of different foods. Plants are commonly underrepresented because their remains are often poorly preserved, if not totally absent. The same is true of fish bones. In whatever food remains do survive, one has to decide whether they are wild or domesticated, and whether they are truly representative of the occupant's diets, which can involve, assess involve assessing the site's function, the duration of its occupation, short or long term, and whether it was lived in irregularly, seasonally, or permanently. A long-term settlement is far more likely to yield representative food remains than a kill site or a specialized camp. In recent years, sophisticated new techniques have been developed which can detect and often identify food residues on tools and inside vessels. For example, in the Solomon Islands, Melanesia, starch residues have been found on stone tools dating back to 28,700 years ago, which constitute the world's oldest evidence for consumption of root vegetables, taro. Chemical analysis of residues in amphora, the great storage jars of the Roman period, has proved that many did contain wine and olive oil, has been, as has been assumed, but some contained wheat flour. Early evidence for wine, a subject very close to archaeologists' heart, has emerged from analysis of a yellowish residue inside a pottery jar from the Neolithic site of Haj Firuz Tepe, Iran, dating to about 5400 to 5000 BC. It has been identified as tartaric acid, found in nature almost exclusively in grapes, and this has therefore been taken as an evidence of resonated wine, the earliest in the world, 2,000 years older than previously thought. A 30-liter Sumerian jar from a site called Godin Depe in western Iran, dating to 3500 BC, also held wine, while potsherds from the same site bore traces of the production of barley beer, so clearly the ancient Iranians knew how to have a good time. And not only the Iranians, the tomb of one of, ancients of, of Egypt's first kings at Abydos, dating to circa 15, 150 BC, was found to contain three rooms stocked with 700 jars. Chemical analysis of the yellow crusts remaining in them confirmed that they had held wine, a potential total of 1,200 gallons. 
chemical analyses of ancient organics absorbed into pottery jars from the early Neolithic village of Jiahu in China have revealed that a fermented drink of rice, honey, and fruit, possibly grape, was being made as far back as 900 years ago, so China's rice wine is the oldest known so far. Chemists have also discovered traces of opium in a 3,500-year-old vase from Cyprus, which suggests to some scholars that a drug trade existed in the eastern Mediterranean at this time. In Britain, on the other hand, ancient pots tend to contain less stimulating substances, such as residues of cabbage. Where animal remains are concerned, they too may only represent a small fraction of what was originally present. Bones could be cleared out of the site, used for tools, boiled for stock, or eaten by dogs and pigs. Other possibly important foods, such as grubs or fur, grubs or blood, leave no trace at all. And although we tend to assume that diet was usually based on herbivores and fish, some cultures may also have eaten insects. Locusts have been found in a special oven in an Algerian rock shelter dating back 6,200 years ago. One area that is still problematic is cannibalism. The only way to prove it in the past is by finding a piece of human tissue in a human gut or coprolite, and so far nobody has done so. Recent reappraisals of archaeological and anthropological Pathological evidence for cannibalism have shown that all claims are open to other explanations, such as violence or complex funerary rituals. But a few scholars persist in interpreting human bones that are disarticulated, traumatized, or covered in cut marks. For example, in some Anasazi sites of circa AD 1100 in the American Southwest, as evidence of cannibalism. They may be correct, but we really have no way of knowing. Like so many things in archaeology, it comes down to a question of faith and personal preference. We know only too well that, from recent cases that cannibalism can certainly arise among people desperate for survival. For example, in the Anduin plane crash or in Nazi concentration camps, and among sick psychopaths. But the very existence of custom cannibalism, where it is habitual or a ritual part of life, has come under serious question over the past few years. Well-documented cases based on direct observation rather than hearsay or propaganda are extremely rare for historical periods, so it's very hard to estimate how common the practice might have been in prehistory, let alone the very remote past. As with plants, animal residues are proving very enlightening, although controversy still rages over the topic of bloody stone tools, since claims that bloodstains can survive on artifacts thousands of years old and can be identified to species are contested. Chemical analysis of residues in vessels have revealed such substances as milk, cheese, and fat. Both plant and animal foods are also well represented in art and in literature, such as wooden models from Egyptian tombs depicting baking and brewing, texts describing the food of the Roman army, Egyptian hieroglyphic texts about corn allowances for the workers, or the world's oldest cookbook, three Babylonian clay tablets of 3,750 years ago, which contain 35 recipes for a variety of rich meat stews. However, no matter how full the evidence from art and texts, they give a very short-term view of, subsist of subsistence. Even shorter-term glimpses come from the occasional finds of actual meals. For example, in the Roman city of Pompeii, buried by volcanic eruption in AD 79, meals of fish, eggs, bread, and nuts were unearthed intact on tables, as well as food in shops but they are a tiny sample from a single day. The same is true of evidence recovered by hardy souls with strong stomachs from the alimentary tracts of preserved bodies or from human turds. The Danish Iron Age bog body, Tollum's man, was found to have eaten a gruel before his death. Sir Mortimer Wheeler, in a pioneering piece of experimental archaeology, tried a reconstruction of this concoction and found it a foul-tasting mush whereas Britain's Lindo man had eaten a griddle cake, a kind of rough bread. Analysis of coprolites from Lovelock Cave, Nevada, dating from 2500 to 150 years ago, revealed the presence of seeds, fragments of bird feathers and fish scales. One from 1,000 years ago contained bones from 101 small chubs, representing a total live weight of 208 grams, the fish course in a single person's meal. Meals are all very well, but archaeology always likes a long-term view, that is, its specialty, after all, which requires some assessment of diet. One way to approach this is to examine the accumulation of food remains through time, and the succession of stratified layers in a site. But there are far more direct methods of learning about diet, from toothware and from bone chemistry. 
Because we are what we eat, diet radically affects teeth. Yes, your mom was right. It also leaves characteristic chemical signatures in bones. Teeth are usually made, teeth are made of two of the hardest tissues in the body, so they usually survive in a good condition. Microscopic examples of their surfaces reveal abrasions and scratches which can be related to meat or vegetation in the diet. As with studies of microware on tools, we know from present-day specimens, in this case not experimental replicas, but living people, such as meat-eating Eskimos or vegetarian Melanesians, what kinds of traces are left by different diets? So archaeological examples can be compared with these in some confidence. In this way, it has been found that fossil humans seem to have eaten less meat through time and adopted more of a mixed diet. Tooth decay can also be informative, indicating reliance on starchy and sugary foods. Teeth can also reveal where people grew up and thus also show their migrations in later life. Tooth enamel forms in childhood, so its chemical composition can shed light on that period through the isotopes of oxygen and strontium which it contains. Oxygen comes from drinking water, and in warmer climates there is more oxygen-18 than oxygen-16, less so in colder climates. Strontium comes from the local geology, and the ratio of strontium-87 to strontium-86 differs geographically. It moves from weathered rocks into soil and thus into the food chain, ultimately winding up in human bones and teeth. Taken together, these isotopes can indicate roughly where someone spent their childhood. For example, the teeth of the Amesbury Archer, a 3rd millennium BC skeleton found buried near Stonehenge in 2002, revealed that he grew up in a colder climate than England, while his strontium ratio ruled out most northern areas. So it was thought he probably originated from the foothills of the Alps and came to England later in life. The greatest breakthrough, however, has come through the realization that chemical analysis of human bone collagen can reveal much about long-term diet. Different categories of plants have different ratios of certain isotopes of carbon or nitrogen, and as the plants are eaten by animals, these ratios become fixed in animal and human bone tissue. So analysis of the collagen can show whether marine or land plants predominated in the diet, and hence land or marine resources of other kinds. This technique is useful for detecting change through time, if human bones from different periods are available. For example, human bones from the Orinoco floodplain in Venezuela have revealed a dramatic switch from a diet rich in one category of plant, including manioc, in 800 BC, to one based on plants such as maize by AD 400. The whole topic of investigating human remains is hugely popular with the general public, which adores the ghoulish and grisly. Mummies are always a big attraction in the museums. However, introductory books on archaeology generally say little or nothing about the people themselves, concentrating instead on their tools, dwellings, art, and behavior. This is a bizarre attitude. After all, if archaeology's aim is to recreate the lives of those who produce the archaeological record, what more direct evidence can there be than the very remains of the actors in the play we are trying to reconstruct? Yet these remains have generally been left to physical anthropologists to discuss, even though they were excavated by the archaeologist. But whoever does the analysis, the data obtained are of capital importance. Human remains can show the age and sex of the deceased, their appearance, their state of health, sometimes their cause of death, and in some cases even their family relationships. In recent years, new developments in biochemistry, and especially in genetics, have begun to replace the traditional heavy reliance on bones, and indeed, the study of early DNA, not only of humans, including Neanderthals, but also of many animals and plant species, is already providing many fundamental new insights into the origins and spread of our species and of our main domesticates and food. This avenue of research will expand rapidly as our ability to extract and amplify minute pieces, bits of DNA from bones and other organic remains improves. Alas, alongside these great strides in our knowledge, one also finds continual stress in the media on using the new technology to clone, and hence resurrect, extinct species. While one could perhaps make a case for this being feasible and worthwhile in recently banished creatures such as the dodo or the thylacine, Tasmanian tiger or wolf, there is no justification for trying to bring back the mammoth, although some Japanese scientists seem to be utterly obsessed with this prospect. The animal has had its day, and its Ice Age habitat has long vanished. Besides, any cloning would involve a female elephant, so the result would not be a true mammoth. And in any case, such an animal would simply be a freak. 
Elephants are supremely social animals, and a mammoth need its herd. It has often been pointed out that the huge cost of such a project would be far better spent on protecting living elephants from the attention of ivory poachers, and hence ensuring that they do not vanish in their turn. As for the cloning of a Neanderthal, another Frankenstein link project that is often mentioned, the ethical problems involved would be colossal. The vast majority of surviving human remains are skeleton or skeletal or cremations, but we do have numerous better preserved, more or less intact bodies that are desiccated, frozen, waterlogged, or purposely mummified, and these can be subjected to a vast battery of tests. Forensic examinations, computer scans, and endoscopes thrust into every orifice. Even in cases where bodies have disappeared, traces of them may be detected. The most famous examples are the hollows left by the people of Pompeii as they disintegrated inside their solidified casing of volcanic ash. When plaster is poured into these hollows, the resulting casts reveal physical appearance, hairstyles, clothing, posture, and even facial expressions at the moment of death. It is rumored that the city's prison contains the remains of several hardened criminals. Numerous footprints, handprints, and painted hand stencils also exist in the archaeological record. One particularly striking instance of vanished but detectable remains concerns the mystery posed by numerous intact but totally empty pots which have been found buried in the cellars of German houses dating from the 16th to 19th century AD. Chemical tests of the sediments inside them reveal the presence of cholesterol, which pointed to human or animal tissue, and steroid hormones such as osterone, so it is virtually certain that the pots were used to bury human placenta after birth. According to local folklore, this was done to ensure the child's healthy growth. Where health is concerned, human remains can be a mine of information. For example, repetitive strain injury is by no means a new phenomenon and facets on various bones from ancient skeletons can be linked with stresses caused by crouching, load carrying, or grinding grain. Most afflictions that lead to death leave no trace in the bone, but where soft tissue has survived, paleopathology, the study of ancient disease, can reveal a great deal. Almost all Egyptian mummies contained parasites which caused amoebic dysentery and bilharzia, and mummies in the New World had whipworm or roundworm eggs. Parasites have also been found in human coprolites and medieval cesspits. There may even be risks for the unwary archaeologist in handling human soft tissue. Scabs and viruses can survive, and nobody knows how long microbes can lie, lie dormant. Infectious microorganisms may therefore pose real dangers, especially as our immunity to vanished or rare diseases has certainly declined. Lethal microbes are a far more plausible explanation for some of the mercifully very rare, mysterious deaths among archaeologists than the ever-popular myth of the mummy's curse. It would be ironic for an archaeologist to catch something nasty from the past, perhaps the ultimate in experimental archaeology. Far safer is the investigation of trauma and damage, such as on the preserved bog bodies of Northwest Europe, many of which clearly met violent de deaths either as executions, muggings, or ritual sacrifices. Tolland Man was hanged, Grabal Man had his throat slit, but Britain's Lindo Man, wittily nicknamed Pete Marsh, takes the biscuit. He had his skull fractured twice, was garroted, and had his jugular cut. Either way, he was, either he was extremely unpopular, or someone was determined to do a very thorough job. The most ancient intact body to have come down to us is that of the Iceman, found in the Italian Alps in 1991. His discovery gained worldwide attention in the media and immediately triggered some amazing stories, some of them probably apocryphal. For example, one woman claimed that it was her father who had disappeared in the mountains. She recognized him from the press photographs. The radiocarbon dates of 5,300 years ago soon put paid to that. Once he was identified as a genuinely ancient body, some women allegedly volunteered to be impregnated with any frozen sperm that might be found in his body. More bizarrely, a gay magazine in Australia claimed that sperm had been discovered in his anal canal, but the scientists were too embarrassed to publish this quote-unquote fact. The true facts about the Iceman are, probably, are actually just as interesting. He was in his mid to late 40s, his lungs are blackened by smoke from open fires, he has hardening of the arteries and blood vessels. He has traces of chronic frostbite in one toe, and eight of his ribs were fractured, but were healed or healing when he died. 
groups of tattoos on his body, mostly parallel blue lines, half an inch long, may be therapeutic, aimed at relieving the arthritis in his neck, back, and hip. But the most remarkable information came from the single surviving fingernail. Lines across it show that he underwent episodes of serious illness when nail growth was reduced, four, three, and finally two months before his death. The fact that he was prone to periodic crippling disease shows he was in a weakened condition. So even in a complete body, one apparently insignificant nail can shed considerable light on a life, an apt metaphor for archaeology as a whole. But the Iceman has yielded other surprises. Almost a decade after he was found, a CT scan of his left shoulder revealed a small flint arrowhead which had sliced through an artery and caused a massive bleeding which led to his death. A more recent scan has also revealed a deep cut to his right eye, either from a fall or a blow to the head, which would have also caused heavy bleeding and could have contributed to his death. These finds are an illustration of a basic archaeological rule of thumb. That is, fresh analyses can often result in startling new evidence. One should never be satisfied with an existing scenario. True scientists constantly question and return to their earlier conclusions to check with them again. Don't rest on your laurels because laurels rapidly die and wither.